Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of a film that really disappointed me. It's a movie that I was looking forward to. I've been curious about this movie for years. It's a film that I've been trying to find for so long, and I finally got a copy of it off eBay a while back, because this is a movie that is only available on VHS. It's on YouTube right now, but the audio gets out of sync after about an hour or so. So, and the picture quality is really bad. So, I've been really looking forward to this film for a long time. And maybe that's part of it. Maybe expectations were too high because it's a movie I've been really wanting to see for a while. But, <sighs> I really, really wanted to like this. But I thought this was, for the most part, a pretty poor, pretty forgettable movie. And that film is Race for Glory. And this is a movie that I think has a small cult following. It's got a 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb. Um, maybe, I think it's a lot of people who are fans of Grand Prix Racing, uh, motor, you know, uh, which is Grand Prix Racing, which is motorcycle racing. It's different than motocross. And this is like the only film that Grand Prix, Grand Prix Racing has, um, which is really too bad because I think nowadays they could definitely make a better movie than Race for Glory, which is just... It's full of all of the typical cliches that you see in every sports drama from the 80s. It's got... It's predictable. It's just... It's not... It's not entirely terrible. It's not a movie that, oh my god, it's so bad that I want to kill myself after watching it. Or I want to shove my head up an elephant's ass or something. It's not that bad. But it's... It's not very good either. It's pretty. It's really forgettable for the most part. A lot of lost potential with this movie. Uh, Race for Glory is a film that was released in 1989. It was the last movie from New Century Film Productions. Uh, New Century, as you can see, there's actually their logo is on the side here. I think New Century. Uh, yeah, New Century Vista Film Company. It's the last film they did, and uh, they did not go out with a bang, so to speak. They ended up paying for two of the right two writers in the actual Grand Prix so that they could use you know footage from the Grand Prix and to use some shots of the actual writers in this film and I have to admit out of all the things about this movie the shots of the races are really well done I have to admit the cinematography and the editing in those sequences are are, are well done it was just kinda hard though I mean to make it really really exciting because the direction was for the most part, I mean, the cinematography was good, but the direction was kind of lacking, and the editing was okay, and I said it's good, but now that I think about it, it was, the editing was just okay. It was competent, but there was nothing really great about it. There's nothing to make it stand out and to really add something to the footage. And the film's directed by Rocky Lang, and Rocky Lang... I, I kind of recognize him because he directed a movie called All's Fair, which I have, which Lou Ferrigno, I believe, has a cameo in. And he's more suited for comedies than he is for drama and, like, any sort of action-related sort of stuff. He just, it just feels like he was the wrong director for this movie. It kind of feels like he's out of his, out of his league. It just, he doesn't really put his, his own personal stamp on it. It just doesn't really, yeah, it, it's one of those films that, it's an interesting movie to watch because of, hey, it's about Grand Prix racing, and it's so rare, and it's so hard to find, but I can see why it's forgot, been forgotten about. And I don't, and it says it's rated R, but I don't, I don't understand that at all. There's barely any bad language in this. There's no violence. I have no idea why this is rated R. That that's that sounds like a, a typo or something on the back of the VHS to me. Maybe there's a, there was a few swear words, but that, that this it's a really weak R rating. Anyway, the film uh, it uh, features music by Jay Ferguson, who's done music for other movies. His score in this is pretty bad for the most part. It just sounds too goofy at moments. It doesn't really fit the racing sequences. And I have to admit, out of all of the things about this movie. The best thing about this film is a song called If We Can Do It uh, by Cliff Magnus, which is an excellent song, and it plays during the final race, and it adds so much to the final race. 
because without the music, the final race is kind of lethargic. But then here comes the excellent song of We Can Do It by Cliff Magnus, and it really adds to the film immensely. I do not really agree with Variety, who said it's solid in direction. I don't really see anything really solid in direction about this. I just thought, it, I mean, it was adequate, average direction. Uh, it could have been anybody who directed this movie. Any director who has remotely, can who can hold a camera could could have directed this film. Um, the film is is pretty simply. It's a pretty simple plot. It's about this um, this this um, aspiring uh, motorcycle racer played by Alex McCarfer, and he plays this character named. Um, Cody Gifford, and he wants to be a Grand Prix racer. He wants to be a professional racer and beat the best. And the best in in uh, the Grand Prix in this movie is a racer named Klaus Krauter, who's a German. And he's played by Oliver Stritzel, and th th he was a big problem. I I honestly thought that that character was one of the film's many problems for me personally. It was just a really bland villain. The guy was not the best actor in the world. He had no presence. And it just, they need, the film desperately needed some villain like Ivan Drago or something, or somebody like that caliber. And it just didn't have that. The guy was kind of a cocky asshole, but not to the point where it was enough that you hated him. And it just really hurt the film a lot, because this is supposed to be your main villain. And there's just nothing really, he's just kind of an ass, but he's not, but ultimately you end up, Alex McCarver comes across as more of an asshole when he gets all cocky later in the film than Klaus Crowder did. So it was just one of those things where I'm like, maybe they should have made Alex McCarver the cocky uh, lead villain. And maybe they sort of switched the, the roles. Um, should have had Peter Berg as the lead and uh, as the lead racer, the aspiring racer, and had Alex McCarfer play the top racer in the country, you know, in the world, play the top racer in the world, and he's full of himself and he's an asshole, and he's the guy you love to hate. And Peter Berg is the good guy, he's the guy you want to win the race. I really think that switch. And you take out Klaus Kroger, and you have Alex McCarfer as the lead bad guy racer, and Peter Berg as the good guy. That would have helped the film immensely because Peter Berg, for me personally, uh, was the old the the other good thing about this movie, other than Cliff Magnus's song, because his performance was okay. It wasn't the best acting in the world, but he had passion, and he he, he definitely looked like he was having fun with the role. Alex McCarver looked like he was just going through the motions. The only time he really looked like he was comfortable was when he was playing a cocky asshole, like when he got full of himself and he, he was just being a dick. And that makes sense because Alex, Alex McCarthur is an actor who's better suited off playing bad guy roles. He was excellent as a serial killer in Rampage, and so I had a hard time separating, you know, his role in Rampage, who played the serial killer, who had similar looks as he does in this movie, because the film was made around the same time, I believe, as Rampage, and here he is trying to be some clean-cut, good guy, and it just doesn't work. I, I, Alex McCarfer just, it's not the type of role that really suits him. He's much better off playing a villain, or playing somebody that you love to hate, or, uh, you know, somebody you're supposed to be intimidated by. And uh, it was just, a, I just thought it was a huge casting mistake. Peter Berg at this time, too, I think was more of a rising star than Alex McCarfer was, because in 1988, you know, in the same year, Peter Berg was doing Shocker. So I, I, I would have went with Peter Berg as the lead, and Alex McCarfer wasn't really that well known at the time. I mean, he had been in a few films. I mean, it's not like he was completely a complete, you know, new newbie or anything but it wasn't really anything really big and he was in the knots landing tv series he was in the tv movie la takedown he was in tv movies of desperado like the return of desperado and desperado with avalanche at devil's ridge and desperado the outlaw wars 
and then he was in Race for Glory. He was in Rampage in 1987, but that didn't really... It was a delayed release. The film didn't come out until years later, so he really wasn't that big of a, a star. Um, so he wasn't a rising star or anything, so I, I really don't understand why he was chosen to be the lead. You also have uh, other actors. Uh, you have Ray Wise, who's in the film as the promoter. They, they don't really have like the evil bad guy promoters, really. It's just, I mean, the Japanese, the, the company is Suzuki. And it's Samurai, it's not Suzuki. It's Samurai as a company. And I think, it's a, I think it was a real bicycle motorcycle co uh, company. And so, you know, the, 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 it does portray the Japanese as kind of the, the bad guys in the film, but they don't do it like really overboard. So Ray Wise just works for them and then kind of, you know, just, it, it's, he just does his job and that ends up having Alex MacArthur on, sign on to this samurai team, the same team as Croder, and it just tries to set up this drama and it just doesn't work. It's just not very enthralling and it's not very, it's not very dramatic either. Um... You also have Pamela Ludwig, who plays uh, Alex's girlfriend. Just an uh, okay performance, nothing really memorable about it. You also have, uh, you have a, there's a, there's a few more memorable actors, uh, you know, uh, that you might, not really memorable actors, but I would say actors you recognize, like Lane Smith, who plays Joe Gifford, he plays uh, Cody's dad. He's not in the film that much, but, you know, he had, he just have some, some screen time and uh, the film tries to set up the drama that you know he passes away but it doesn't have any impact it's one of those few films where okay the dad passes away but since uh, Cody was gone he was on driving in Grand Prix you know with with team uh, uh, Croder with with uh, Samurai that he comes back home and then it was just this sheriff guy is waiting at home and then tells him your dad died. It doesn't have any of the impact as that as as normally that type of sequence would have because it's just one of those just after they just throw it out there for extra drama because we're trying to pad out this film's running time. The film tries it, it tries to be, have, be funny too and it, most of the time it just doesn't work. Um, so it. But it, it, I did I didn't mind uh, Peter Berg. Peter Berg had some fun lines of dialogue, um, nothing super memorable. But you could, like I said, you could tell that he's having fun with the role at least, that he's at least enjoying himself, and that's why I wish he was the lead. I mean, look at him; he's got the aviators and everything. I mean, if you saw this cover, you would think Peter Berg would not be more than just some mechanic in the film. But no, he's just he's just Alex MacArthur's friend. He's Alex MacArthur's uh, friend, uh, Chris. And, you know, it's really too bad because I, I think Peter Berg would have, being the lead, would have helped the film a lot. Because um, he definitely has a, he has that, you, you root for Peter Berg. Uh, and he gives a shit about the film, too. So that would have helped a lot. That would have helped the film immensely. So pretty much, it's, it's just one of those typical. They these these two friends they build they they work on a bike they build it they want to use it and go to Grand Prix and win it all and the the film opens up with the, them they are uh, Chris and and Cody are doing their jobs which I guess is like for some reason like paving they're like putting concrete on you know uh, I don't know like what they're doing like they're paving asphalt or something and then they end up. Cody ends up getting up in the more, more early in the morning, gets on his bike, and starts basically training for the race in this small town. And the people in the small town aren't, aren't, aren't liking that. And then he talks to his dad and talks to his other guy, and then the sheriff, and then he gets permission to go try to race in the qualifying race, which is in this around, the, it was, it's near the, the town, near the area where Cody is. And so they do that, but then Cody doesn't qualify because he 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 falls off he's, he falls off his bike or his bike seizes and he falls down and then he gets back up though Peter Berg puts him back on his bike and he still races even though he's been disqualified but he did a good enough job and kept up with Croder that he caught the attention of Ray Wise's character who is played by who plays Jack Davis 
And so Jack sees potential in him, so he decides to get sign on. Basically, gives them a, a new bike because the bike doesn't work anymore, and because it crashed. Because that's what happens too. He not only falls down, but he crashes his bike, and uh, Crowder crashes too. And so the bike's totaled. But Ray Wise likes what he sees, so he says, "I'll give you a bike, and you can race in, you know." the Grand Prix, you know, you can race in, in, in the, the, the tournament, the big tournament, and so, he, uh, Chris and, and Cody, they go on, on a plane, they go overseas, they go see the bike, there's a misunderstanding, they think they're gonna do, they're looking at this other bike, but it's really a prototype that's not meant for them, so they, they don't even actually see the bike that they're supposed to use, like, it was just a setup for, oh, you're using the wrong bike, <laughs> Hey, and you're looking at the wrong bike. And then there's drama with with Peter Berg and Alex MacArthur, where Peter Berg just, because the first race Alex MacArthur has, uh, the bike wasn't tuned up properly, and it doesn't end well. And so, you know, the, it, it's one of those things, it's like, it's not even really real drama, because Alex MacArthur has a point. He's like, you screwed up. That's why I want to hire samurai, the samurai uh, tuners who actually know what they're doing. But it was you and me, man. You know, this is what it's just like. You, you don't know what you're doing yet. It's 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 just useless drama. It, it's totally padding for the film's running time. The movie is it, not very well paced either. It's 102 minutes. It doesn't need to be that long. So th then, of course, you know, then this this starts the deterioration of friendship and Alex MacArthur starts being a dick and signs with Samurai and you know Cody you know is trying Chris is trying to tell Cody that you know they signed you they gave you the prototype bike man you know that's the bike that they gave you who knows that might not work right you know I'm trying to look out for you man it's like fuck you you know they, they fight and then they fight in the mud it's just typical uh, whatever friends fighting uh, there's drama with him and his girlfriend, and of course before that you had to have the typical montage, the love montage, which is so ridiculous in this movie because it has a song that is so, ooh, this song is. It starts off so bad with the really sappy ass saxophone uh, solo, but it gets a little bit better as it goes on. But it's still it's a very cliched, lame love montage, and then it doesn't last. The love doesn't last because. Alex MacArthur lets things go to his head, and then warns it ruins his relationship with his girlfriend and Peter Berg, and they fly back home, and then he wins races while he's with Team Samurai, and then something happens, there's an accident, one of the guys that he was originally teamed up with, he gets in an accident, like, and so then he just... He gets disqualified or, or something. I don't know what happened. I don't really care. That's the thing. You have you really don't care what happens to Cody, and and so he ends up going back home. That's where he finds out his dad is dead, and then he rekindles his friendship with Peter Berg, and they build their bike that they've always wanted to build, and then they go on the Grand Prix and they win. Of course they do. And it's like the first ever American-made bike winning, win, they, and they win the Grand Prix. And then they drive around victory lane at the end, and that's it. That's Race for Glory. I mean, I really, I, I, I couldn't really go any more in-depth with this movie. As you can see, I'm just, I'm, it's not a very enthusiastic review, because the movie never really felt, made me feel that enthusiastic about it. And that's really too bad. It's got a good idea. I like the idea of a sports drama, but with Grand Prix motorcycle racing instead of all the other types of sports that we've seen done a million times. But the movie carries over the same cliched, same been there, done that screenplay. And that just doesn't make the film stand, that doesn't really help the film. The racing itself is not enough to make the film stand out for me. It's pretty tedious, it's slow, it's boring, because you've seen all this done before, and it's predictable. And it's not even, it's not even, it's not even fun to watch. That's the thing, it's not, it just, it's, it's, it's a chore to sit through. Like, the first time I tried to watch it, I couldn't even do it. Like, I was falling asleep, so then I had to start it again, and then it was still a chore to sit through. It was really too bad. 
And I want. I really wanted this film to be a, an unsung classic or a gem, but it, it just wasn't for me personally. I know a lot of people really like this film, and to each their own. And I think I'm like the only person who might be doing a review of this movie on YouTube. But it, it's just a movie that I had a little bit of higher expectations for because of how hard it, how rare it is, and it just. It, it, and I was curious about it, and it just wasn't really that great of a movie. I do have to admit, though, like I said, there were some good things about it. I did like the the, the way the racing scenes were shot. I did like the cinematography on those with those sequences. I I like Peter Berg, and um, I like the song "If We Can Do It" by uh, Cliff Magnus, and. I, I like the way the race ended. It was it was it was the final race ended. It was something different. I mean, it was the only time I've really ever seen a film where the lead, our hero, wins the race because the villain, his his motor, his his uh, his vehicle malfunctions. That's what happens. He try he's trying to smoke out Alex MacArthur, and he messes something up on his bike, and Alex MacArthur goes in front of him because he decided he was trying to do some. He tried to win the race the way that you're not supposed to and he overheats his bike and I was like okay that's something different I mean okay I'll give the film credit for that but it doesn't make the rest of the film that was really boring and just cliched and just uh and you've seen it a million times any better so um yeah it's, I really don't know what to say about Race for Glory except it was a rated out of five stars I give the film uh, it, it's, I pro I'm, I'm going to give it two, two out of five. It's a poor, it's a, like I said, it's a poor film. I wouldn't even call it an average movie. I, I'm perfectly fine with never seeing this film again. And that's too bad. I mean, because I, I really wanted this to be a good one. Um, but it just, it just wasn't. And, uh, there are much better films than this, like Days of Thunder and, and Rad, for instance. Uh, Rad is is silly and goofy at points, but in a fun way. Um, Race for Glory takes itself a little bit too seriously at points, and then when it does have fun with itself, it's not for long enough. It just is a film that just is really bland, and it's about as it's it's it, it's a cinematic equivalent of a saltine cracker. It's just. That's all you get. I mean, it, it's it's edible, it's watchable, like a saltine cracker. It's edible, but it's not something you want to eat all the time. Uh, if you had other choices, you'd choose a ton of other options rather than eat saltines. And that's pretty much what this, this film is. It's saltines, or cinematic saltines, or cinematic white bread. Um, but, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's too bad. Two out of five stars. Uh, I've seen worse, but I've seen a lot better. Anyway, thank you for watching my review of Race for Glory, and I will see you guys later. See ya.